Stani mal. What's happening? What's man? What's happening with you? Did you just hey, wake up? No, never. But what's uh, is that the quarantine effect for you to be on time for the first time ever? Or? Amazing, man! Amazing. If, if this can help you to be on time for the future, please. <laughs> <laughs> ne well, next step is that I'm on time for the practice. This, I'm not sure it will ever happen. Okay, well, at least I'm trying. You know. Yes, at least you. At least you know. You know. Look, look. I thought. I'm re I'm also ready to practice here. I brought the racket oh, and nice. balls. Nice. You know, so if you're ready, I'm 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 happy to play virtual tennis with you. Is that French Open ball? No, that's uh, actually Australian Open uh, 2013. Ah, okay. The one uh, yeah. you remember, 1210. Yeah. This, well, one, I don't, this one I don't remember. But <laughs> <laughs> one of the many I don't remember, unfortunately. Exactly, yeah. Roland Garros, I only remember the 16. F yes. 15, I think I played finals, but I, um, I, don't, I don't know what happened that day. Um, Me neither. Did you play that year? I think I did play it. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, you were the funny guy with that crazy shorts. Hey, be oh. careful. Hey, be careful <laughs> because it's there. <laughs> I knew it, man. For sure, you knew. I hope okay, you still so have the please, one I gave it to you. Okay, so so I remember. Let's start with with uh, with uh, with shorts, please, because that has been the topic uh, in the last twenty four hours. Okay. So um, I would like to ask you, what is the story behind that shorts? Um, who came up with the idea? I would like to know who came up with the color, uh, who came up with the style. Like, I, I would like to know everything. Please, lead me through it. There is not much to say except that uh, <laughs> actually I find the picture the first time I tried them was in 2014 in Tokyo during the tournament. That's when I got the, the clothes. But uh, as you know, I, I wear uh, the clothes they gave it to me. Yeah. And uh, well, but you didn't have you didn't have the say uh, in the design like they didn't ask you previously. No, not for that. No. After that, I start. We start to have more conversation about it, the colors and things like that. I could, I could after see the, that. the evolution after that <laughs> evolution. <laughs> I tried to get a little bit less color in one one shot, but uh, yeah, at least it made people talk about it. Well, listen, I think with that that shorts uh, that shorts, you know, uh, won you one of the biggest tournaments in the world. So. Uh, you should definitely yeah, wear it more. Yeah, people remember more about the short than about <laughs> me winning, so that's the problem, maybe. Wait, do, uh, uh, do I remember well that you put the, sh the, the, the shorts next to the trophy? Yes, I did. Finals? Yeah, I did. I had to. I, I received too much, uh, too much people talking about it and just yeah. that, so I said at least he got it. <laughs> How are you, man? How are you spending your time? I've I've seen you're very very uh, active on Instagram. I've yeah. seen that you work out every day, or you at least not every day. Unfor unfortunately, not every day, but uh, I'm trying. No, it's been honestly, it's been it's been great. I cannot complain. Yeah. Uh, living in a nice place and spending a lot of time at home for once that we're not used to. Spending yeah. a lot of time with my daughter also, so that's something different and. Uh, than normally, so at least this is positive. Are you but doing home homework with the? Uh, I'm with doing the girl? school, not not yeah. every day. Uh, the mom do also, and I do a week there. But uh, yeah, right. I'm, I'm I don't feel um, I don't feel she's lucky to have a teacher like me. But <laughs> <laughs> well, it's what good. about you? Yeah, I mean, same thing, you know, I, uh, we had, I had a nice chat with Andy yesterday about, uh, you know, about being at home and about mm. how, does, how does that feel, you know. Yeah. I think uh, it's, it, in a way, it's strange because it's the first time, I mean, in, in my uh, last 15 years of my life that I've been in one place more than, uh, yeah, I don't know, almost yeah. two months. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that I that that I spend so much quality time with my uh, uh, family, you know, with my children, with my wife. It's I, I'm really grateful for that. I, you know, obviously this uh, coronavirus situation is is terrible for a lot of people uh, in Europe and in the world. Uh, a lot of people losing losing uh, lives and a lot of people being locked down in in, a, in small apartments and it's yeah. it's tough. It's really tough. But I I think. 
on a bright side um, that you know we have in a way a blessing to spend time with uh, with our family you know and especially for us tennis players uh, we are as you know we are on the road at all times uh, we are under huge adrenaline constantly uh, traveling from one place to another not really taking much time to to reflect or or we don't have much time it's basically our off season is what like one and a half months where you have to train for four weeks so you kind of have two weeks maximum of, of resting so i'm not complaining it's a great sport i love it but uh, at the same time I, i try to see everything that is happening right now as, as a positive thing at least for for family yeah the big difference now now i feel like is we don't have we are staying at home and we have to so we spend time at home but we yeah. don't have the pressure of feeling we have to practice we have to be in shape we have to be ready because the others are playing there's tournament coming soon you yes. don't feel this pressure so you can really focus on on enjoying the time that you have to spend at home it's true it's true did you did, are you learning some new skills are you learning languages or anything <laughs> like this no I'm, i'm learning i'm trying to to teach my daughter that's the, okay. that <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, there's this now we have I mean, we have time to also try to do some things that uh, we really wanted always to to do and we and never what had are you doing? time. I mean, I like languages, you know, so I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to, you know, work you on already my... speak like 10 languages, so. Well, yeah, there is there there is uh, what there's like over I don't know, 200-300 languages or even more, no, but which so... one are you learning now? Uh, I'm starting a little bit Russian. Hmm. and um uh, I, i i need to um, i need to get better in french maybe you can help me with that yes we can peut-être peut-être mon pote <laughs> peut-être and um also german i used to speak it so i'm going to try to work on that a little bit and uh i don't know you know you, you have a lot of time to read i think i'm i'm reading different books what are you reading these days you have any any I'm book reading you recommend I'm reading more about uh I like uh, biography about sports athletes I like to I like to learn a bit from other and uh you know I always try to learn from you from other guy when we can talk and uh for me that's that's something really you can use as, as an athlete nice nice did you watch um Andy uh, Andy's uh, documentary yeah of course of course Do you I like it course. yeah i love it i love it everything that can give you something that you don't see something more mm. into it more deep it's always interesting and especially with Andy who gives so much i think it was great yeah 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 of course it gives you gives you insights on i mean he was struggling a lot in the last three years you know mm. with with injuries so it was very interesting to to kind of get a little bit closer to him through that documentary of understanding what he's really going through i think that that part where uh they were showing the surgery uh yeah. that that was a bit too much for me i mean it was really hard to watch some people have the stomach for that i don't have the stomach for that but it's uh yeah it's it's really hard i mean you went through you went through also quite a few injuries yourself right the surgery of the knee a couple of times Yeah I've been I've been there I think like when I was younger I had the first one 2000 uh, 2007 uh, that was okay that for me was was going quick but the last one in 2017 the big surgery of the knee for me I really struggled mentally to mm. to get out of it for me it took me took me a lot of time and I think like especially because in tennis it's never stop we always there is always a new tournament always something new coming the mental part is the most difficult one yeah what what do you feel mentally is is what 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 kind of uh what part of the 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 mental challenge would you would you kind of say that is that is toughest for you to to handle i mean when you're coming back what is for me when i was when i was coming back is is to be patient i'm really impatient mm -hmm. and to really accept it and to take the time you need to do to to come back and when you got such a big surgery uh later in my career when I'm closer from the end but in the same time I was at my best uh level that I never had was was mentally tough to to really accept it and to to do the work I needed especially because 
there is a lot of question mark. With my surgery, it was a lot of question mark because we didn't know if my knee will handle that surgery and if I was going to be able to come back. So that was the, the toughest part. Uh, and when I came back the first time in Australia, it was six months after, I knew I was far away from my level, but it was in a way to test it. But I was hoping that after that, it was going to go only step by step better and better. But it went the opposite for a few months before after coming back. So basically, it took me almost more than a year to, to come back to my level. And mm. mentally, that was the toughest part. Yeah, of course, of course. I was sharing the same thing yesterday with Andy as well. Uh, when we talked about, you know, the comebacks and the injuries and how that affects your emotional, mental state, how that affects your character, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're playing on a, on a very high level for many years and then you're, you know, you, you know that, that you have the quality to be a top player and then because of the ranking system and everything, if you're out for, for a long time, like six months or more, you know, you're losing a lot of points. Mm -hmm. Sure, you can use your protected ranking here and there, but your ranking is quite low. So you have to rebuild everything from the beginning, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I agree with you that that, that emotional aspect of, of kind of, I think it's, it's always a, a biggest challenge to really internally um, have this conversation with yourself in a, in a, in a most supportive way for yourself because you are your, yourself your your own biggest i would say opponent and supporter um but i think the fact that you are coming back to the same community to the same environment uh where you have been winning the biggest tournaments where you've been at the top of the game and then you come back to competition again after an injury uh, and and physically your body probably has to reprogram itself but yeah. and 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 mentally you have to do the same but mentally it seems like you don't want to do that because you, the last memory that you had was positive and you were, you were mm. dominating the tour or whatever. You were, you were one of the best players in the world. And now you have to kind of start from scratch and then all of a sudden the movement is not as dynamic, as, as efficient as it was before. And then you start to create doubts in yourself, um, all these different... Uh, 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 obstacles, mental obstacles come there and say, you know, am I, am I capable to do this? Uh, am I ready enough? Maybe I, I, maybe I, I was uh, rushing too much. Maybe I'm not, I, I was supposed to be more patient. Once you start to ask the, yourself questions, so you questions know how it is. it's over, it's over. It's, 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 but it's, um, for me personally, uh, tennis uh, court uh, uh, is, a place where I get challenged the most in my life. Hmm. So uh, on an emotional, uh, psychological level and physical, of course, as well. Uh, that's where all my programs that have been maybe suppressed over the years, emotional things and whatever, even some traumas, they surface there. Hmm. Uh, is it the same for you? Do you feel like, like tennis court is a kind of a battlefield for you, for, for you yes. internally as well? Big time, because that's when you get all the emotion and you have mm. to control them because one, sometimes you get tired. So when you're tired, yeah. the emotion are coming out even more. And you know that if you start to have doubts, the level is going to drop. You know, if you start to think a little bit too much of what you want to do, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, it's going to be a different match. And there is, for me, it's always been like a big puzzle. You have to put all the pieces together to play your best level. Mm. And in my career, it took me so many years to get there at my best. And, and I, knew, I, I knew at that time that when I was feeling good with every aspect of, of the game, but not only tennis, mentally, physically, then I was the best player I could be. And, yeah. But it's, it, it, ask, it takes so much to, to get there. But not people see only the match. But for me, it takes so much in the practice, in the practice session, to push myself to know that when I'm gonna be in a big match, it's gonna come. It's gonna be automatic. I'm gonna I'm gonna do things without getting in trouble mentally. And how uh, how did your uh, private life and everything that you experienced, you know, with your family or privately, let's say off the court, affect your performance on the court and everything is happening because for me personally I always 
believed uh, in the holistic approach to life. I mean, I, I can't separate, even though I understand that, you know, throughout my life, I also had people that were telling me, you have to separate and differentiate yourself as a tennis player and yourself as a, you know, brother, son, father, husband, and whatever. So you have to separate these two. I, for me, it was uh, never really uh, something that resonated with me, if you know what I mean, because I'm the same person that I'm on the court. I'm, I'm also the same Novak off the court. So, yeah. of course, that I have a professional transformation when I'm on the court and turn into a warrior. But, uh, but at the same time, I, I just felt that everything that I was experiencing in life was, um, was transferring to the court and how I felt on the court, how I was able to uh, keep my concentration, intensity, recovery, and so forth. How, how, how was it for you? No, I think the private life always affects the way you feel it because it's, again, about the emotion, about the way you feel mentally. But I think during my career, at times, at tournaments, I could get into my bubble. And I was really, doesn't matter what was happening outside, I, I, I find a way with myself to be okay. When I'm on the court, there is nothing can affect me. Nothing else mm -hmm. gonna affect me. But this is only a few tournaments, so I'm basically counting the Grand Slam. But yeah. The rest of the time is uh, is really tough to 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 completely separate your private life or what you're doing outside the court, off court. It, it's always gonna affect you on the court. I feel. Oh, for sure, for sure. And uh, if you don't mind me asking, what is what is the biggest motivation for you now? Uh, at this stage of your uh, career uh, and your life as a tennis player, what what motivates you the most on the on the tour or so forth? Or was is it traveling? Is it achievements? Is it something else? For for me, first, since I came back from the surgery, but since I came back at the level, I feel good with it. So that means basically since since last year, when I feel good on the court, I feel like I appreciate much more what I'm doing and what I'm I'm achieving because before that. I always felt that you run about the next tournament, you run about the next match. You don't have time to appreciate the way you're playing or what you're winning or not. And that's for my career. And so now I appreciate much more. What really motivates me is the emotion I get on the court with people, with the fan. Uh, I feel like last year was one of my best year emotion-wise on the court. French Open, I had an amazing crowd with me or against me and many tournaments and that's something that i really enjoy uh my dream is to win more tournaments that's for sure because uh last one was long time ago that's one of of my goal and again is those emotions but not only on the court but also the pressure you feel and the way you build yourself as a player mm. I, i'm a big believing it trust the process do the work you need and it's going to pay off sooner or later. And that's really what I want to keep pushing myself to. But right now is not the time you really push yourself. But yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're right. You have to kind of pace yourself, you know, and I, I, I'm a big believer in work smart, not just work yeah. hard. I think, mm. you know, each one of us is, is, uh, is different in, in our own individual special way. And so we all have... Uh, different bodies that require different things, different amount of work, specific work and so forth. We were actually, uh, Andy and I were speaking about that yesterday, the, the, the very same thing that you said, the, the appreciation for uh, everything that you're experiencing on the court. And because of the constant uh, um, uh, competition, the constant travel, adrenaline, um, expectations, pressure, that you pose on yourself, that you feel from the environment, you're, you're on the road constantly, as, especially if you're at, at the top, uh, uh, you're expected to win most of your matches. So you move from one tournament to another in literally few days time, you have to change the surface, you have to change the country, the continent, you don't have time even to celebrate a big win because you know, you have like, for example, uh, Madrid, Rome back to back. So mm -hmm. you have to travel the, the next same evening or the next day. So, you know, those are a little perks of, of tennis, which, uh, of course, make our sport very special. But at the same time, it, 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 you're right. Uh, it, it, has, it reminds us, you know, I, I think this kind of time where we don't compete and we have several mm -hmm. months 
I feel like uh, it, it's a great time for us to practice to be more present. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I, I feel like in the matches, uh, when I play my best is when I'm completely fully in the zone, which means I'm fully present and attuned and uh, everything flows. I don't need to mm. think about what I need to do. It comes automatically. Yeah. But, but uh, you know how many, how many matches you and I and tennis player has lost in his life because you're just overthinking and you're doubting yourself and you're you know folding maybe under pressure because you just don't maybe trust that at that moment um that being there is enough that you feel like you have to do more and create more so you start paying attention to all these distractions the crowd the this and that and it becomes a it becomes a huge mess basically but to, to talk about crowd how do you how do you deal? Because there's a question I received many times. And yeah. honestly, as a tennis player, a fan, I watch you play those years and especially last few years. And how do you, how do you deal, especially when you play Roger, yeah. with the crowd against you? Well, uh, of course, it's not easy. You know, when you have most of the people mm. in the stadium cheering for your opponents. And I, I personally feel that as long as there is respect, meaning if, if they cheer for my opponent and they don't disrespect me, I am, I'm okay with that. But if there is a disrespect, then I can react a little bit emotional. And I, of course, I understand that as well, um, those kind of reactions that I have towards the crowd at times throughout my career, I'm not proud of them. And I'm, it's not something that, I, uh, that I'm, I am in favor of and that I'm supporting for myself to do because I know that there is no, it's not necessary at all for me to react because in the end of the day, I have to preserve all the energy for what I have to do, you know, and, yeah. and play the best tennis I can possibly play and stay present. But, you know, we are all people, we all, we all get emotional, we all get uh, distracted and stuff like this, especially if you're alone on the court, we're individual athletes, so we don't have anybody to really rely on and this is, this is what you have to deal with and that's, that's what makes you tough mentally as well. But uh, honestly, uh, at earlier in my career, when I was experiencing um, uh, matches, especially against uh, Roger and Rafa, where most of the crowd was cheering for them, it was tougher for me. I, I felt yeah. like it's not fair that, uh, you know, I deserve more support, so forth. And I, uh, and, uh, and I was spending a lot of energy on that. I was more emotional about that. But then yeah. I, 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 I think through, throughout my own evolution as an athlete uh, and, and experiencing these kind of situations more, I just, I, I accepted it. And by accepting it, I, you know, I, I felt like huge relief and I, I, I also felt I managed to conserve more energy that I can use for more constructive things, you know, for myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's my, Stefan, my boy, is here. Oh, he's there. <laughs> Stefan, hey. Stefan, hey. Stefan. Stan. Stan the man. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. You good? <laughs> yes. Yes? Igor Stenich. Peter Skadoch Stenich Igor Stenich. Hmm? He would like to play tennis with you. He's just shy to ask you. But I cannot. Whenever. When you invite me, I will play with him. For sure. <laughs> okay. Are you so, practicing tennis or no? No. Well, we are. You know, we are playing a little bit in the in the garden, basically. Yeah. You know, just uh, we put a little net so we play. And he's um, he likes to play. He's he's, he's motivated now. We'll see how that how how that works in the future. But going back to what I was saying is is uh, uh, as well. Um, uh, what I said after the finals last year against Roger in Wimbledon, which was, mm -hmm. you know, one of the most epic matches that I was that I was part yeah. of, um, and there it was uh, it was really interesting, you know, in terms of the the crowd support and everything. With most of the people were were cheering for him, and I mean that was that was obvious from on and off the court as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, at, at that's the why you think it's still like that. Why is it like that? Why you think it's still like that why do you think why do i think it's still like that yeah well look you know i mean <laughs> we can we can discuss about various things uh, and 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 factors why this is in such way or other way it's it's really hard to say I, I mean for sure one thing is that roger is you know arguably the greatest player of all time he's uh 
uh, he's the guy that is liked around the world. So I, I don't expect, to be honest, uh, in most of the cases, as long as he's playing the crowd to be in majority on my side, if you know what I mean. Yes, some places maybe, but in most of the places they're going to support Roger and I'm okay with that because this is, it's Roger. So, and it's, it's very similar situation with Rafa. So, yeah, it's, it's hard for me to, to, to answer to that question. Why is it like that? Am I contributing to that in a negative way that I'm taking away the crowd support for me? I don't think so. I think it's, I think it's more just the greatness of Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal. Uh, and not them just as a tennis players, but them as, a, as people, as very charismatic, uh, 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 you know, nice guys, humble guys, great champions. And that have, you know, made huge mark in our sports. And I am part of their era. So in one way, I'm lucky. In another way, maybe not so much. So uh, I guess, I don't know. What would you say? What do you, what do you think about it? <laughs> you ought to know what I think. <laughs> but I think, I think it's, a, it's a bit of, for sure, what you said, that they are amazing champions like you are. Uh, they are, I think, in your young age, you were a bit different, of course, like yeah. we all are. And that they took this spot already of the nice pair, uh, humble and uh, always fair play and all. And that in a movie, you cannot have three good guys. You need someone who's a bit against. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I'm saying that with a lot of respect, you know? No, of course, of course. And that's probably, I think, when you were all three younger, that's the direction that everybody took a little bit, and now it yeah. affects a little bit yeah. right now. Yeah, but that's it's just true. My it, vision. It, no, no, it's, it's you are absolutely right because my my uh, beginning of of the rivalries that I had with these two guys, it was like uh, I was um, this confident young player that was saying. Yes, I respect Roger and respect Rafa, but I can win against them. I can win big titles. I can be number one. My goal is to be number one. And I think all of that has created uh, this kind of, uh, I would say, feelings with people and this kind of uh, situation where, uh, you know, people were asking, who is this young guy to challenge the big Rafa and Roger? And then I was um, feeling like it's me against the world in a way, you know? And, but you and, also and like a little off, bit. You also yeah, need no, no, that it, it, a little bit. Yeah, that's how I felt. I don't feel that way anymore, to be honest. I mean, for, for many years now, but especially in the first, well, three to five years, I was feeling like, okay, it's me against the world. I got to prove it to everybody. I'm going to fight. I'm going to, you know, not give up. I'm going to be, yeah. you know, focused and I'm going to be fearless uh, warrior, you know. Yeah. And of course, it did give me results in terms of tennis. And everything, but um, at the same time, you know, of course, it was uh, uh, giving me a situation that was uh, difficult to to also handle, you know, because yeah. I went every time I would go out on the court with them, it would be it would be tough, and it still is. But you know, uh, I guess it's, it's different work. from from my perspective. I have yeah. internally, I have uh, changed the way I'm 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 experiencing this, that I'm yeah. seeing this, and. So that has changed the whole external experience for me as well. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Do we have some? You have some questions, from Pot? <laughs> I have a question from. from I receive a lot of questions, but one from my coach Magnus. He asked about you, coach Ma Maya. What was for you uh, the part of your game he most influenced? Uh, what What was the part of my game that my coach Marian has influ uh, has influenced positively? The most. Yes. Um, because you've been working now for how many years? We've been working. We started working in 2006. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, been 50, it's been 15 years. Yes. And uh, Marian has been there, you know, more or less from the day one uh, yeah. of like pro tennis. And uh, Marian, Marian has been uh, an, an incredible role model for me in my life. Uh, it's it's really hard to talk about him only as a tennis coach. You know, he's uh, he's like a brother. He's like a father to me. He's like family. Really, we've we've shared so many moments. I remember, you know, uh, times when I was struggling mentally, emotionally. I would go into his room crying, uh, 
uh, was, I think, one uh, moment when I was really down on myself where he lifted me up and helped me tremendously was in 2010. Uh, I think when I lost to uh, Meltzer in quarterfinals or Roland Garros, I was two sets to uh, love up and I yeah. lost in five. And then I had a little bit of a crash and, and I went to his room crying on the floor and he was there for me, him and, and also Milan, um, my physiotherapist, and one of the best friends in my life. You know, these guys have, have been a tremendous uh, support. And Marian, in terms of technical stuff, uh, on the court, um, I think I think he has helped me um, a lot with positioning on the court and how to uh, um, how to tactically uh, execute uh, the right shots at the right time. Hmm. Uh, we worked over the years on forehand and backhand, probably a bit more on forehand uh, and serve as well, and we were bringing in. Um, you know, uh, other coaches on board as well. Boris Becker. Yes. Uh, I think Boris I saw Boris. Watching. I don't know. He's watching. I don't know. Hi, Boris. Yeah, he's watching. He's here. Sure. Boris. Yeah. Shati, we get there. Um, he's an uh, he's, he's amazing guy and he has helped me tremendously with my serve because I, I feel like earlier in my career I was serving well and then I had this elbow injury and then I... You know, everything started to change. My technique uh, has has shifted, and I, I don't know. I lost my rhythm for the serve, and then Boris. Well, quick came joke, in. quick joke. I, I thanks Boris. Yeah. Because in quarterfinal, <laughs> Australian Open, you made serve and volley on match one against me, and you missed the volley, and that was the transition <laughs> for you when you were starting <laughs> to go for the nets. Well, to be quite honest. Uh, yeah, he did not say anything about that play. He probably liked uh, the play the from ID. the standpoint of being courageous, but I don't think he... He, did, he was not actually making me play serve and volley, but he was just... Uh, we were working a lot on the serve. And mm -hmm. same thing also with Boris uh, uh, and now with Goran Ivanishevich as well. He's like, we, we, Marian and I have always tried to, to see... You know, what are the, the, the little details that we can improve in the game mm. biomechanically, uh, in terms of tactics, in terms of strategy, in terms of positioning on the court? You know, uh, at, at that highest level, uh, everything matters, as you know. So, so uh, I think Marian has contributed uh, uh, to, of course, everything, every shot, because it's hard to pick yes. just one shot. The beginning, yeah. He worked on that hard, but I think mostly on the um, uh, on how to strategically place myself on the court and position myself so i can execute the best shots at, at the right time yeah yeah been so long with him also the... yeah 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 how long have you worked with uh, magnus we start in 2013. 13. okay yes, you guys March, have been so a long time also yeah yeah nice big one slam with him so what do you what do you feel magnus has contributed the most to your game but I think like we got also maybe not as long as you, but for me, we are really close. Uh, he's like a really close friend. We share everything. Uh, he saw me cry more than one time, <laughs> unlike you, <laughs> cried many more times after losing. But uh, I think in my game, something that really helped me is that to practice in a way that it's come back a little bit more automatic when you play the match. And that yeah. you know that when you start to have doubts during the match, you can rely on what you did in the practice court. Mm. And, and that's something that helped me to get confidence little by little. And for me, that's one of the big reasons of why I start to suddenly win bigger matches in my career. I have an interesting question for you because I, I've always, it was, it's very uh, interesting for me to, to, to observe players um, um, in terms of, of in terms of uh, the practice and how that translates to the match, do you feel like are you one of these players that needs to hit an extra ball on the warm up or on the practice so you can feel the shot more, or you know when it's time and you say okay it's enough so less is more and basically that's gonna make you feel better on the match. No, I think less is more. Especially, especially later on my career, because you need to be careful with your body. Sorry, so, one second. Sorry, Stan. no problem, no problem. Super, that was such a touch. Right. Sorry. 
Yes. So for me, yes, less is more because you need to be basically fresh mentally, physically for the match. But I'm kind of the player who needs to quite of have the hours of practice before that. Yeah, I just need to find the right balance of okay. when I can push myself and when not. But I'm not, I'm not the player who's going to warm up, miss the last match and ask for more smash because he missed one smash. You know, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I know when I'm ready. And when I'm ready, I can completely turn off one, two days before the match. Interesting. Interesting. Because sometimes for me, I actually, I, I, I do both. Sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like less is more. But actually, uh, also quite a few times, I feel like if I miss a smash, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make another one and another one and another one. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the warm up for the match goes for like 45, 50 minutes. You know what I mean? And I. Yeah, but like, smash wise, it didn't work yet. Uh, sm <laughs> smash wise, it's still not working. Don't forget, so anybody... forget the warm up. It's smash. Exactly, exactly. So anyone out there that knows how to hit the proper overhead, please let me know. Text me direct message, Instagram. I'll respond. Uh, <laughs> um, Okay, so do we have uh, any any other questions maybe from the fans? Do you want to see do you have any questions? The... There was many. Let me check a bit what. Yeah, kind of question came back often is when was the match match you lost and you were the most angry going out? Well, w uh, one of them was uh, with you. Uh, Roland Garros finals in 15. But why you were hungry? Uh, and uh, another one was probably also with you in 15, uh, no, was it uh, 16 in uh, New York? I don't know, for some reason you make me angry, man. Oh, come on. <laughs> you completely not me. Hey, you, my game. You guys, you guys can leave a little <laughs> bit from yours, so please. I've no. Been, I've uh, been 15 years on the tour and I, really, I got only a few, so please let me that up. <laughs> No, but, I just. But I just, why you get angry? Because you think you played bad. You think you no, missed because, the opportunity to get, or just because you lost? Exactly. Well, no, no, not. Uh, look, uh, both of the matches that I lost to you in finals was at Roland Garros and U.S. Open. Mm. I felt that it was a very similar trajectory mm. of the match. Yeah. I started well. I won first set in both of the matches, and then some close games pretty even in the second set where result was kind of here and there didn't lose my chances and that's where you pick up and then then you go to a level which was higher than mine and you just you were better player and you won against me so i was not upset with um the way i've played because if you if you just overplay me if you're just better that's it i i cannot be uh too upset because of that uh, i just have to accept it and 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 say well done but i was uh, i was uh, upset with myself that i repeat the same thing twice mm. that i that i allowed you to, uh, to take a the level. momentum and the control of the match and mm. i feel like I, I i had an opportunities in both second set of both finals to to just you know win the second set and then the probably the match or, or there would be a much higher chance for me to win with being two sets up. So, so this I was upset with this kind of uh, outcome, so to say, for, with my um, uh, um, loss of concentration and loss yeah. of intensity, probably in the in those moments. That's all. What about you? Uh, me, I will say, um, uh, was one match for sure. Clearly, world to final against Roger when I. Had Made yeah. a match front to play you in the final, but was not to play you. Was just like to make to have the chance to play the final of the world to final for for a tennis player. Something so big, and I know that that day I let him win. Like you know, there is not that much. I know I had everything in my game and in me to finish it, and I made the mistake I shouldn't have done it. And another one. Big one was uh, again Gasquet in Wimbledon quarterfinal. I think it was yeah. 2015, and I lost 6-4. And I think the level in general was really good, like for me on grass. But for me, I was really angry to not have the chance to play you in the semi-final, especially just after, because we played 
against each other on every surface, but not on grass. And I was happy, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I'm not I'm sure. Sorry you that would you have killed that me man, anywhere. So please, you would have killed me anywhere on grass. But I would have. I, I wanted that day so much to play you in the semi-final of Wimbledon. That yeah, I was I was really sad after that match. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how long does it take you usually after the match like that where you, I don't know, you feel like you let yourself down in a way, you know? I mean, how, how long does it take you to recover like and be ready for back next, next match, next in, turn? In World to Finally, it took me, uh, I let myself be down the next full day, but then I had to push myself because we were going to play the Davis Cup five yeah. days or six days after. So I had two options. One, to stay down and and knew that day that then you give you'd not give yourself the best chance to play well in Davis Cup mm. or just be like okay I give 24 hours to my brain to completely be down to be sad to be mad anything any emotion out but then you focus on the next next match and the next match is so important that it's going to make you forget what you lost before that but I also feel that early on my career it took me longer to get over matches, especially big matches. But when I start to basically, well, after my first Grand Slam, it's always been short. It's always been short. Like I lost, okay, I lost. It's not the end of the world. Next one, go back to practice. You know what it takes. You know what you have to do to be at your best or at least to give you chance for that. But normally right now, like last few years, it, it doesn't take time to to really get over it. I'm already thinking about, okay, what do I want next? Do you like watching your own matches and analyzing? Um, I feel like that's not something I'm the best at. I feel like I watch sometimes a little bit points there and point that, but for me, I feel like I know exactly what I did. I know exactly when I lost the match. I know exactly when I did this double fault. I know exactly that at that moment I went a little bit defensive like i can tell you every match i know what happened in the match so for me watching it it doesn't really help me unless i do it with my team and then my team explain to me something but they can explain to me without watching the match because i know exactly what happened so yeah. that's that's not my favorite i prefer to watch other tennis player yeah. I prefer to watch you I, I in tournament i love to watch the match like when i'm back in the room hotel especially in grand slam I put the TV on and I watch the match because I think for my career, I learned so much by watching you guys and practice with you guys. That's, that's when I, it helped me so much to be a better tennis player. Absolutely. Yeah, same for me. I think I, I love watching tennis. I think for most of the guys, it's the same. You know, when mm -hmm. you're during the tournament, you're like always constantly following what others are doing and, and analyzing their game and trying to pick few things that can you can implement maybe in your game and try and i i feel i i also like even when i'm not in the tournament like when i'm at home i like to go on uh, youtube or i like to look at uh, uh, some uh, uh, replays and highlights of the matches or some slow motions from like all the players from roger rafa yourself or anybody and there there's always something that uh, uh, is very in interesting for me to really um, try out myself on the court yeah. the next time I'm hitting a ball. And and uh, but same like you, I I don't particularly like watching myself, mm. even though I know that like Kobe Bryant, for example, uh, was was always talking about the importance of even though you feel very bad about you know, playing a certain way and, uh, um, you know, you lost the match or whatever, that you have to go back, you have to go right away and see that replay. And even though if it hurts badly, uh, you should just, you should stick with it because that way you are um, also uh, kind of proving to yourself that you can do that. And that, just sorry. One yeah. more. <laughs> sorry um, and um, so so I do understand that there is an importance of that and I do I do prefer watching and analyzing the videos of myself from the practice sessions yeah. or like practice sets or whatever if somebody records me um, 
and but not so much from from the matches and uh, I like I actually like do going like like uh, fast forwarding through the match like just at particular points of the match yeah. where, as you said you know you all know exactly it's, I feel is exactly the same so I just try to look because I use the memory of and remembering which part of the match mm. uh, was a change in my game that caused mm. me to maybe lose that match and I go to that right away for and me I see what happened. Yeah, for me, if I watch my match, it's more to watch what my opponent did, you know, because I know what I did and I, I feel like I know the mistake yeah. I've done, but I want to understand why this player pushed me to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or maybe sometimes during match, I feel like uh, after the match, oh, he played so well, he was so aggressive, he pushed me so much. And if I look back, I'm like, no, you gave him the ball to be aggressive. He wasn't, the, he wasn't an aggressive player. So... I like to watch yeah. more to understand what happened at the opponent from the opponent. Yeah, yeah absolutely, and, and you're right. And there's, there's, um, it's funny, but how emo uh, 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 emotions can play a game with us. You know, where yeah. even if you win like easy first set, the, you know that the next few games are crucial for you to maintain One that, point, that two level. Point, right? You know exactly that's. You know, I think like with with age you know even more. You anticipate even more that yeah. next game, this one, he can make the difference. You know? And that's, that's, I think, something I feel dangerous for me with age and later on my career is that to not anticipate so much what can affect or not the match and to stay more in the momentum. Because yeah. you've been playing those matches so many times that you know exactly that one break point, one point at that moment can completely turn the match. So sometimes you think too much about the future and not yeah. to the moment. For sure, for sure. All right, Stanima, let's see. Um, you have, we have a few more questions maybe here from the fans. For sure. Let's, you let's really, yeah, you let me know if you have an interesting question that you want to... I cannot get the question, only you, because you've been online. But you can see the, the comments. The comments, yeah. The yeah, comments. in the comments, comments, yeah. Uh, you both have the best backhand, one and two-handed backhands? Question mark. It, was that a uh, was that a question or is that? A... But we know about you. That's what <laughs> <laughs> I know about you as well, man. So we all one good. Ever. So we all good. <laughs> We're all good there. Okay, <laughs> let's keep going. We got we got time. Okay, let's let's do two more questions. Two more question. Yeah. And uh, if you get good uh, question, let's see. Let's see. Stan, Stan, are you thirty-five? Are you 35, Stan? Yeah, I had really? a great birthday alone. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I 35, have. man. Yeah. It's okay. late, huh? No, you look, you look younger. What are you, what are you, what are you using? What's your secret potion? Oof, you don't want to know. <laughs> it's not vegan. It's not vegan. <laughs> Let me guess. It's not vegan. Let me guess. French wine. French wine. More Italian wine. I'm more Italian. You like Italian yeah. wine? Yes. Ooh. Right. Oh, more romantic soul right there. <laughs> um, really? you got any good questions? See, no, no questions so far. A lot of hearts. Thank you guys for being here. Um, Chrissy Everett is watching. Ah, where do you where do you see tennis in ten years? That's a good question. Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a very good. Actually, maybe Stan, you can answer that first, and you can tell me where do you maybe see tennis after Corona, and how is that? Go how is Corona? Honestly, there is a lot of question mark about. Ah, uh, then I have one question also for you because okay. I read a lot of stuff. But no, uh, no, after Corona is a lot of question mark. The pro the first question is when is going to be the after Corona? Yeah. That's well. That's yeah. something that I think uh, yeah. most of the people on this planet don't really know. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the the problem in tennis is we come from every country in the world to play one tournament. Yeah. So how can we handle that? Yes. That... How can we handle even if we play without fans? There is like in a Grand Slam, there is what two, three thousand people working for the tournament to make it happen. Yeah. So all those questions is quite complicated to to handle it right now, especially that right now is the worst time. We are in the big crisis, so it's difficult to understand when it's going to open for us. Yeah. 
Well, I, I think <clears throat> you're right. Uh, this kind of unpredictability is uh, something that uh, uh, we are not used to. Also, I think as tennis players, we are always used to knowing uh, what the near future is going to look like. We make our schedule, we make our plans almost one year ahead. We know where mm. we are going, what we're going to play, where we're going to be. So this is, uh, is, is very interesting and at the same time uh, also uh, um, disturbing, you know, for, for all of us. And, and I think uh, uh, what you mentioned about tennis being a global sport, uh, the disadvantage of tennis comparing to maybe some other sports like, I don't know, that are played on the national level like NBA, NFL, NHL in States is that, um, is that we have to uh, travel and change places so frequently, literally week after week, we have to be in a completely different country on a different continent. And that's, that's uh, I don't know how that's going to be like uh, in, in the future, uh, near future or whatever it is, whether it's in a in couple of months that we can start to travel again or not. What is it going to be with the vaccinations? Is it going to be an, obligate, is going to be a, an obligatory vaccination for you to travel or not? I, I, you know, it's, it, it looks like, I mean, obviously, as you said, there's a lot of question marks. And um, we also have to, I think, consider, consider some, um, some other maybe concepts uh, included in tennis, something that is, uh, you know, I guess more played in a certain continents or in certain areas like of Europe yeah. or States. I hope it doesn't come down to that because our sport is all about international opportunity and about possibility for everyone to travel and play tournaments all around the world. But if, if this, Corona uh, virus situation escalates even more. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that we are going to, in a way, have to find to a solution. Find, find some solution. solutions because uh, uh, guys who are ranked between 200, 250, especially to to 700 or even even higher, mm -hmm. are thinking about leaving tennis right now. You know? Yeah, they because they, they already you know, barely make a living, so it's it's tough exactly for, that was my question. Yeah, about it. How yeah. do you? Because uh, we all tennis fans and everybody start to read things that came out from from yeah. from the top. How do you think tennis can help those players who barely make a living, but they yeah. like to be 250 in the world in a ten in tennis? It's already amazing. Yes, and they barely can live right now. So yes, what is the option that can help them to at least survive the coronavirus until we can start to play again? Well, I, let me answer that question uh, from two perspectives. First, short term mm -hmm. and then long term. I think short term, uh, I, I spoke to, to Roger and Rafa a few days ago and we had a long conversation about you know, about future, near future of tennis, what's going to happen, how we can uh, contribute and how we can help especially lower rank guys who yeah. are obviously struggling the most of anybody uh, because majority of the players who are ranked between whatever, 200 and 250 to, to 700 or 1,000 don't have federation support, don't have mm. sponsors. So they, ha they are completely independent and kind of left alone. And, uh, and so um, I'm really glad that, that, uh, that ATP... Um, uh, grand slams now, uh, most likely, and players, hopefully, if we all get together, will contribute collectively to the player relief fund yes. that uh, ATP will distribute uh, uh, using uh, certain models of and criteria. Uh, like, mm. for example, I mean, you don't want to, uh, you want to avoid giving money now to a player maybe that fits into this group of, of people that are ranked lower but doesn't need money uh, yeah. as much as maybe someone else mm. because you know he has been I don't know a top 50 guy for a long time now he's been injured so maybe he doesn't need as much as the other guys need so there's certain criteria uh, rules that will be in place and ATP is working on that so uh, right now it looks like there's going to be hopefully somewhere between 
uh, three and four and a half million uh, dollars mm -hmm. that is that is going to be distributed to 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 these lower ranking guys, um, and then uh, other things short term that we can do, and that depends obviously on the continuation of the season, and that's something that the players also have to agree is that whether or not uh, in the certain tournaments, maybe World Tour finals, maybe bonus pool for for uh, uh, top guys in the end of the season, uh, that kind of money, whether that kind of money will also be uh, transferred to this relief fund. Yes. Uh, or if we don't have any tournaments this season, uh, maybe we can collectively take certain percentage from our prize money from the Australian Open uh, in January and, and direct that into the relief fund. So there are always ways that, that you can help. I'm really glad that tennis ecosystem is coming together yeah. uh, because I think uh, everyone realizes the importance of uh, um, the base of the tennis. And these guys are, uh, that are ranked from 250 onwards, they are, they are the ones that, uh, that make the grassroots of tennis, that make the future of tennis. And mm. I feel like, I feel we have to be united. We have to uh, support them. We have to show them that they're not forgotten, that we are there for them. But also I feel we have to send a message to the, to the uh, uh, younger generations that are, that are taking in consideration to be professional players and to show them that they can live out of tennis Yes. Even at the times when there is a, a, a pandemic and there is a financial crisis, that they still can can uh, rely on right. the support of the of top the guys of the ATP as a governing body mm -hmm. of ITF or Grand Slam. So that's short term. Long term, I think that what we did now in a short in a in a short term, which is coming together for this cause, mm -hmm. I think this is necessary to happen in a long term, which is a more complicated. Because, as you know, there is ITF, that is Independent Entity International Tennis Federation, a longest standing tennis federation in the history of our sport. Then you have, obviously, Grand Slams that operate as independent entities. And you have ATP uh, as well. You have WTA. So all of us have to consolidate somehow and come up with a plan and a system that will support, especially the base or the grassroots of tennis, which is this lower rank guys, uh, both men and women, we have to somehow regulate better the, the uh, initial levels of professional tennis and, and, and allow these uh, players that are starting to play professional tennis to have an easier way of transitioning to the higher levels. Yes. You know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah. right now, a few years ago, there was a, a, a rule change uh, with the challengers, the, the challenger tour yeah. and the transition tour. I don't think that's good, to be honest, because it creates even more separation there. Yes. So there are ways it's not going to be ideal, but I'm glad that at least we're all looking into changing things for better. And there